name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among them. Blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, that instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, granted by the same Spirit, we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation to the same Christ our Lord. Amen. O God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <coughs> So, good evening. Good evening uh, starting next week, we're going to start a consecration program to Mary. It's going to be just three weeks, so it'll be shorter. So, if you'd like to come that invite friends, uh, this would be the time because it's the month of May, which is the month of Mary. So, uh, it'll be 6.30 in the evening on Sunday, so we invite all of you. And uh, we'll give you a flyer at the end, which will specify... But pretty simple. We'll have it uh, next week. And we'll be using uh, my book that I that was published in 2017, which is Consecration to Mary Through the Mysteries of the Rose or so. Uh, if you don't already have that book, if you could try to get it, okay? You can go to the office and pick it up or maybe order it. Um, I would say probably go to the office or, or come, come to my confessional because I've got some copies there. So I invite all of you to, to um, come to the consecration to Mary. I think this is the temptation uh, for probably most of you is that you're probably going to say, well, I've already consecrated myself to Mary, so why should I do it again? And I think it's a good idea to, to renew it every year, maybe twice a year. Uh, I made my first in 1976, no? So, and then after that, I wanted to become a priest. So it was through that that Mary mot motivated me to want to become a Catholic priest. So I think it works. So um, even though you've done it, uh, you can always go deeper. And, for example, the Acts of the Apostles, has this course been helpful to you? Yes. Probably most of you have read the Acts of the Apostles probably 50 times already because you, you get it every, every uh, Easter season. But I find myself fascinated with it. I'm, I just spent a uh, half hour watching the movie once again. I just, the movie by, by Dean Jones where it's just word for word and they're, Acting it, I I almost didn't. I was glued to the screen because it's so it's so fascinating. So uh, the danger is that we can say, well, I I read that, I know that. Why do I have to go back and do it again? But because that's the temptation. But every time you go to the Word of God, the Word of God is going to touch you in a different way. Okay, the Word of God is the Word of God. But, for example, none of us are the same person that we were a year ago. There's, you know, there's changes. Hopefully for the better, right? <laughs> Hopefully for the better. So um, uh, I would invite you to do it. And like this course, uh, my, my book is very easy to follow. I give you the biblical passage and then... Each one, of the med each one of the mysteries, I give you about five to ten points. It's very Ignatian. So, thank you. So, uh, uh, it's, not, it's uh, pretty easy. And my, my hope is that you really fall in love with the Blessed Mother. And that's my... my my charism, I'm an oblate of the Virgin Mary. I want everyone in the world to fall in love with the Blessed Mother. Then she's going to bring us to Christ. 
then Christ will bring us to God the Father. That's the way it works. And I think every one of us can admit our devotion to Mary can go stronger, right? Right? Yes, Father. So, um, I've already prayed. I've already prayed my five rosaries today. Have you? <laughs> yeah. So I prayed five rosaries today, and probably if I had to pray a six, I wouldn't complain. I mean, the more we can love Mary, the more we can pray to Mary, the better. And I really believe that the most important thing I did today was say two masses and then then pray. And now from my prayer is coming some very humble apostolic works, but the most important part of my day was that I spent the first two hours in my holy hour, then I said two masses, then I said, got my five five rosaries in. So this was a good day for me. Because I was able to pray maybe a little bit more than the other day. So if I have a day in which I'm praying more and better, it's a good day. Whether or not I see any apostolic fruits, that's that's secondary. So if I can go do days where I'm praying more and better, I think souls are being saved, even though I'm not going to see it. And uh, so that that takes us in to the topic today. <clears throat> what I'm going to try to do today is... I actually wrote out a I wrote out a long worksheet that I was going to give to you on the Holy Spirit, but our printer broke down. <laughs> so I spent a long time writing out a I think a pretty well written worksheet, somewhat catechetical on the Holy Spirit, and I was going to give it to you and fill it in, but the printer broke down, so I can't do that. <laughs> So I thought that what I would do, my, my inspiration this morning was, um, I'm going to try to be somewhat ambitious, is go through, go through the key uh, protagonists in the Acts of the Apostles and how the Holy Spirit touched them and how the Holy Spirit can touch us in the same way. Okay? So I've written down actually 12 altogether. Okay? Twelve persons. And I'm going to point out how the Holy Spirit is working in them in a powerful way, but each one is different. Mm -hmm. Each one is different. I like to give images from nature, and a couple images I would give would be this. See the Holy Spirit as a diamond, and the process... In physics, when you studied physics in 11th grade, you probably studied the process of refraction. I don't know if you do that in the Philippines. Refraction means it's breaking into pieces where you take the diamond and the light of the sun goes through and it breaks into multicolors, kind of like a rainbow. No? Kind of like a rainbow. And that's the way the Holy Spirit is going to be working on David in a different way that he's working on on Colette. And the way we work on Eric is going to be different than Osvaldo because you're different persons and the Holy Spirit adapts himself according to all of us. He adapts himself. He's malleable. Malleable is a good English word. It means being able to mold. He molds himself according to who we are. So that's one image I give to you, the idea of refraction in the diamond. Okay, any of you do the Liturgy of the Hours? Okay, some of you, okay, we're going to be coming close to Pentecost and we're going to be reading uh, one of the greatest writers, which is St. Basil the Great. Okay? Probably have heard of St. Basil the Great, some of you. He's one of the, he's one of the Eastern Fathers of the Church. We've got the Western Fathers, which would be Augustine, Ambrose, Jerome, and Gregory the Great. Then the Eastern Fathers would be would be Basil, Greg, St. Gregory, uh, Nazianzen, Nisa, St. John Chrysostom is the greatest. St. Basil, I'll, I'll try to explain it as best I can, one of the readings of the the Hours. He says, this is the way the Holy Spirit works. 
Have any of you done any garden work? I have in the past, no? We're in Hawaiian gardens now, right? Okay. <laughs> but if you've ever done any garden work, if you notice, you, you, if you, you take the, um, the sprinkler or you take um, water, when you put it on the ground, it's going to be different the way it reacts to a flower, a plant, a tree. So it actually, the water adapts itself to each different element in nature. Isn't that beautiful? Yes, Father. I love that idea. So if you've ever done work in the garden, if you place it on, you place it on the dirt, it's going to be different than on a plant, or then on a tree, then on a pine tree, then on fern, <clears throat> then on a carrot, then on a, then on a, on a flower. So once again, you have the Holy Spirit is, adapts himself the way the water adapts itself to, to, to plants. Got it? So those are, those are two images I'd like to start off with as I go through the different personalities in the Acts of the Apostles. Okay, so the first person we're going to be meeting in the, in the Acts of the Apostles is the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit. So hopefully, as a result of your meditations, you're getting to know the Holy Spirit better. In a certain sense, if we really want to become saints, the Holy, <coughs> the Holy Spirit is he's the, short, he's the shortcut. John the 23rd, Pope St. John the 23rd, who was canonized with John Paul II, he said that the saints, the saints are the masterpieces of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that beautiful? So the saints are the masterpieces of the Holy Spirit. So all of you are called to be? Saints. Okay, saints. You're all called to become saints, no? So it's not Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci or Cavaggio. Okay, <laughs> but rather, and those are great artists, aren't they? No, you've heard of Michelangelo, right? Caravaggio, Da Vinci. These are some of the greatest Italian artists. But we've got something better than them. We've got the Holy Spirit. <laughs> we got the Holy Spirit to work on us. Okay, so let's move then from the Holy Spirit uh, to the person, I've written these down, the person of, okay, let's, let's, go to, let's go to the person of Simon Peter. So we have the person of Simon Peter. The thought that occurred to me is the, the, the radical conversion and transformation in, in Peter by the working of the Holy Spirit. Your friend Fulton Sheen, he's your friend, okay, says that he's got two names, Simon and Peter. Simon is the man living according to the flesh, and Peter is living according to the Spirit. If any of you are interested in, in writing a book, okay, I, I'll give you an idea. I'm the idea man, then you can maybe compose it, and then we can maybe sell it, no? So I've never, I've never read a book on this topic. I mean, there are probably hundreds, if not thousands of books written on St. Peter. But have you ever come across a book on Peter, the contrast between Peter and the Gospels and Peter and the Acts of the Apostles? I've never come across, not that I've read all the books in the world, <laughs> but that would be a very interesting study. Very interesting, wouldn't it? As we see Peter in the Gospels, I mean, he's got moments of great light. But we see him, we see him in moments of great weakness. We see him, you know, saying, Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, and Caesarea Philippi, right? 
And then he, he starts walking on the water, and guess what happens? He sinks. And he, after he says Jesus is the Son of the living God in Caesarea Philippi, what happens right after that? That Jesus says that he's going to suffer, die, be crucified, and the third day he rose, rise from the dead. Peter takes him apart, and he starts to reprimand him. We should never try to reprimand Christ, should we? No. <laughs> sharply, rebu- sharply rebuking Jesus, saying, Lord, God forbid that this should happen. And what would happen if after this course, I took you aside and I said, you are a, you're a devil. You'd never come back again. You would probably call the bishop on me, huh? <laughs> probably would. Well, Jesus called Peter, Peter a Satan. Strong word, huh? Because you're not reasoning according to God, but you're reasoning only according to human standards. So the person of Peter, I would say, trying to relate to us that Peter was converted by the Holy Spirit. Okay, He was converted by the Holy Spirit. And that you meditated upon a good three weeks ago or 20 days ago when you were meditating upon Acts chapter 2, if your memory is not foggy. (laughs) That was Acts Acts chapter 2. It was Pentecost. The Holy Spirit descended upon him and we see this man that's just radically transformed. A few days before, he couldn't even say that Jesus was the Lord. They asked him three times, and what did he do? He said, I don't even know him. And Jesus said, before the cock crows, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. So here you have someone that cannot even say that Jesus is Lord. Then after Pentecost, he gets up, and he preaches a brilliant Brilliant, brilliant homily. Which it's going through all the you know the prophecies, the Psalms, uh, that all refer to Jesus Christ and his passion, death, and resurrection. So, and then he ends up by converting three thousand people in one homily. How about that? If I could convert three people in every homily, I'd be happy, no? Yeah, let alone the 3,000, no? knock out the three zeros, no? If I could convert three people, starting with myself, uh, I would be pretty happy with that. But you see, this is, the, this is the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, in us, we have the Simon and the Peter. Hopefully, by the end of the course, there's going to be more Peter and less Simon. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Yeah, we got the Simon and the Peter battling within us. And then, of course, this month of April, we want to be more led by the Spirit than by being led by the flesh. Yeah. Led by the Spirit, not by the flesh. So, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the second person in our list. The first person we're talking about is the Holy Spirit. Okay, then the third would be okay, the third would be the paralytic. In Acts chapter three. The paralytic was healed because of the words of Peter. He said, Silver and gold I have none, but in the name of Jesus get up and walk. So two things, the power and the word of Peter and his faith. Because he looked at him and he saw that this man had faith. And Jesus would not do miracles, nor would the apostles do miracles, if there wasn't faith. It all depended upon faith. So Peter looked and said, silver and gold they have none, but in the name of Jesus get up and walk. I'd like to tell you a personal experience that I had related to this passage. 
1985, I was a deacon in Rome. And I would... One of my apostles was to work with the missionaries of charity, Mother Teresa. So if you've ever, done, you've ever been in Rome, you have what's called the Stazione Termine, that was a train station where there's just a lot of poor people, and they opened up a house for the, basically, the homeless men. So I would go with one of the other seminarians once a week, and we would go and we would give them a little homily and sit down and talk with them and, uh, and encourage them. So uh, I, would, I would walk about, probably about a mile and a half from our house to the place. When I was coming back one day, I was praying the rosary with one of the other seminarians, and there was a there was a beggar in front of me. And he had his hand extended, and um, I I couldn't do anything because I have a vow of poverty. I I, I don't have any money, no. Mm-hmm. Kind of like Peter, no. So the man was begging me for money, and I said in my Italian, which was pretty good back then, mi dispiace, no cello, okay. Any of you speak Italian? Mi dispiace, no ce l'ho. Mi dispiace means sorry, no ce l'ho means I don't have it, I don't have any, you know. So he kept insisting and he was walking like this, like a, you know, paralytic. So um, I, I said it three times and I walked about 50 steps. And I turned around and the man stood up straight and was cursing me out in Italian like this, okay? <laughs> giving, me, giving me the cornudo, no? Okay? When I arrived back at the house, I told one of the other seminarians this. And he said, what you should have told him is, silver and gold, I have none, but in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. <laughs> Every time I, I read through that story, I always call to mind that experience I had as a deacon in Rome with that, with that beggar that I actually, I guess I healed him, didn't I? <laughs> Or he was faking it, no? <laughs> okay, let's move on. This is kind of like the Beatles' magical mystery tour, right? <laughs> okay, the fourth one that I've written down is Philip. Okay, we, we, we talked a little bit about Philip. Philip. Now, there are two Philips. There is uh, Philip the Apostle, and then there's Philip the Deacon. And um, the part I was watching today says, Paul meets Philip the deacon who had four unmarried daughters, okay? So you've got (coughs) Philip the deacon. You meet him the very beginning of the Acts of the Apostles before the conversion of St. Paul. And he's just a heartwarming figure. But I, 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 I love the way I love the way he's depicted, just just the way he acts. Because related to the Holy Spirit, he's very, very docile. And let's be honest, we are sometimes not very docile, are we? We can be pretty obstinate, pretty obdurate, pretty headstrong. No? You see in Spanish, cabezon. I mean, it can be pretty... Pretty hard-headed, huh? And we see him, we see him, God tells him to do something. He says, wait a minute, let me first finish this and then I'll think it through and I'll get back to you tomorrow. No, He doesn't say that. And the, I think the best passage is God says it's both the Holy Spirit and his angel, both of them. It's his angel and the Holy Spirit that are working on him. Tells him to get up and head toward Gaza on the southern route. So he heads up, he heads heads to Gaza on the southern route, and he meets up with this Ethiopian eunuch who had made a pilgrimage from Ethiopia to, to Jerusalem. And on the way back, he's reading the prophet Isaiah, and he's reading it uh, out loud. I think it's somewhat comical as he runs up beside the chariot and he said, what are you reading? 
Isaiah, do you understand it? And he says, how can I understand it unless someone explains it to me? So he invites Philip to get up beside him. And there, Philip, we don't know how long, maybe it was, maybe it was an hour, maybe two hours, going through all the verses in the Old Testament that pointed to Jesus. And apparently spoke about baptism. Because they see water along the way and and he says, what's to prevent me from being baptized? It, with great humility, gets down, goes into the water, he baptized the eunuch, and then it says the Holy Spirit snatched him. Almost by the hair, no? <laughs> he snatches him and he places him in another place, heading to Caesarea, where he's preaching the word of God and he's casting out devils right and left. <laughs> he's preaching, he's healing, and casting out devils. So, here we see a, a man who is very open and docile to the Holy Spirit. And very open and docile to his guardian angel. And I think that we have to pray for that grace. God is going to be sending you many inspirations. Pray for the grace that we would be docile docility. If you, any of you have spiritual direction, okay, you have to pray for the grace to be docile to the working of the Holy Spirit. To be docile. The Holy Spirit inspires you to do something. Don't say, well, I'll think about it. I'll do it tomorrow. No. Do it right now. And if you frustrate the Holy Spirit, He's a He's, uh, as they say in Spanish, un caballero. He's a gentleman. If you say no, he pulls back. He recoils. But then you say yes, he gives you more and more and more and more graces. Such that the Holy Spirit can always rely on you. The more that you obey him, the more he's going to be relying upon you to carry out great things and become a saint and bring many people to Christ. Yeah. So that's Philip, that's Philip the deacon. Okay, well, okay, related to this would be the would be the, the the Ethiopian eunuch. Okay, this Ethiopian eunuch was obviously very highly educated. Okay, was obviously very highly educated. He probably knew more than one language. He was reading back then. Most people couldn't read and write. And he had made a pilgrimage from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. So he was, he was willing, he was willing to allow someone to give him, he was willing to allow someone to give him proper direction. And that's a good quality. We shouldn't feel that we're a know-it-all, that we know everything. But rather, allow ourselves to be guided and directed by others. Especially before making important decisions, the virtue of prudence, which is perfected by counsel, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, is manifested by the docility of consulting other people to help us to make proper decisions. To make proper decisions. Right before here, there's a young man in the 12th grade who's asked me, where do I go to college, Father? Hmm? Where do I go to college? He said, I'd like to, I'd like to go to Franciscan Steubenville. He okay? said, if you go there, if you go there next year, you're going to be meeting three of my nieces that are going to be the three of them at the same time. <laughs> but I ask, um, do you have a lot of money? I said, I don't have any money. No. Are you going to have, do you have a scholarship? No. Well, when you graduate, it's probably going to be, you're probably going to owe at least $200,000. Do you have that? No. <laughs> and that never occurred to him. So the fact that he asked me advice, and I'm a little bit older than him, 
I tried to give him advice that he has to look into these factors before choosing. You end up by graduating having a good degree, but you're going to have about a quarter of a million dollars to pay off. That might take 25 years to pay off. So part of, part of being open to the Holy Spirit is allowing some people to give us advice that have greater expertise in that area. So that's my interpretation of uh, the, the Ethiopian. He was a highly educated man. But he recognized he didn't know everything. We should recognize that we don't know everything. Okay? Yeah, Socrates says the only thing he knows is they don't know anything. <laughs> so be aware of there are a lot of, there are a lot of uh, uh, areas in our life where we have, where we have um, a lack of knowledge. Okay? Lack of knowledge. Okay, let's move on. Let's move from the Ethiopian eunuch. Okay, move to St. Stephen. St. Stephen. Okay, there are various qualities of St. Stephen that point to his openness to the Holy Spirit. Related to... Related to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you see, you see St. Stephen being illuminated by a gift of the Holy Spirit, and it's called understanding. Okay? Okay, understanding is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Remember a couple weeks ago, we had the Gospel where it says that Jesus appeared on the road to Emmaus, and then after that, the two disciples went back to Jerusalem, where the apostles were in the upper room, and Jesus greeted them, and then he showed them his hands and his feet. Then it said he opened up their minds so they could understand Scripture. Remember that? He opened up their minds so they, they could understand Scripture. So that's one of the virtues of Stephen related to the Holy Spirit is that St. Stephen understood sacred scripture. And I hope in this mini course that we've had that you're starting to understand scripture better. Are you? Yes. You're starting to understand scripture better. You know, you read it last year. Okay, there are certain things this year that you read it last year, but there's a deeper insight. And that is the gift of understanding. Stephen had it. Perhaps to a higher, higher degree than us, okay? But there's no reason why we can't ask St. Stephen for the grace to read sacred scripture and like a light will pour into our intellect. We're reading it and say, wow, I never, I never noticed that before. That passage that verse, that word, I read it already a hundred times, but this time I read it and it's like it exploded from the page. That's one of the things we can learn from St. Stephen and his relationship to the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? Okay, let's go beyond that. Stephen also, okay, that's... Um, I'm going to be talking about various manifestations of the gifts of the Holy Spirit manifest in the Acts, but these individuals. Another one would be that of fortitude. What is the, what is the, the gift fortitude? Yeah, forti yeah for fortitude is a willing a, a willingness to be able to suffer for Christ. Okay, a willingness to be able to suffer for Christ. Easier said than done, huh? Here, in the midst of good company, okay, like-minded people as most of us are, that's why we're here. But when we're put to the test in which we're being attacked by people, if not physically, verbally, for us to be strong and maintain our peace and tranquility, we must have fortitude. We must have fortitude. 
Now, if you are following Christ, Father, uh, Father John Lyons, who was here before, I think any of you were here in the parish, he was here about 20, uh, about 20 years ago. Father John Lyons, one of his homilies said, if you, if you live out the first seven Beatitudes, then you'll, be, you'll, you'll, be, you'll receive a gift. You'll, give the, you'll get the eighth Beatitude, which is, blessed are those who are persecuted from my name. So if we're really living out the Beatitudes, then we shouldn't be surprised that we will be persecuted for the name of Christ. You hear me? Yes, Father. We shouldn't be surprised. That's part of the game. And often, where the persecution comes most is not in Iran or Iraq or in... um, someplace in India or Africa. Sometimes you can be in your own home. Hello? Yes. Sometimes you can be in your own home. It might be, be, it might be your husband. Or it might be your adult children. It might be someone who lives in the house with you. And they see, they see you getting up early. You know, you're making your holy hour. You're going to Mass. You're praying your rosary. Uh, You're reading the lives of the saints. You're no longer looking at those type of programs on TV. You're dressing more modestly. Your language is a little bit more, a little bit more refined. (laughs) And you know, they they say you're you you're a religious fanatic. You're a fanatic. Why don't you just go back and be a normal person, okay? Ever hear that? Yes. You know, you're, you're, you're kind of, you're, you're a religious nut, nut, you really are, okay? But thanks be to God, we're attached to a really good bolt, that's Jesus Christ, amen? Yeah, amen. okay. So you shouldn't be surprised that you are suffering for the sake of Christ. That's one of the Beatitudes. So Stephen suffers for the name of Christ, but also in his suffering, he does not hold on to resentment, but he forgives those who are persecuting him. That's, that's very important too, because you might be persecuted, but you might be angry at the person that's persecuting you. You might be vindictive. You, want, you might want to see if you can get even. You want to maybe, okay, this person has hurt me. I want to see this person squirm like a worm in hot ashes at least for half an hour, okay? And then after I see him squirm like a worm in hot ashes, I heard that from a Protestant pastor, then after that I'm at peace, huh? Okay, so there we have Stephen is his, his manifestation of fortitude as well as mercy and forgiveness. Okay, the next Ah, one of my favorites. Barnabas. I would say this year, uh, going through the Acts of the Apostles, this is the person that probably jumped out at me most, is Barnabas. I mean, he's always been there. But just aware of the, of the, the charming, um, encouraging, uh, unifying, loving person that this St. Barnabas is. So let's talk a little bit about him. And then maybe, perhaps we can maybe form a Barney Club, okay? Would you like to belong to the Barney Club, okay? You can maybe be the vice president, and you can maybe be the, the secretary, and you can maybe be the treasurer. And we'll find a position for both of you, okay? Okay. Okay, Barnabas, how was he related to the Holy Spirit? And how can we make a connection between Barnabas, the Holy Spirit, and ourselves? Okay, the word Barnabas means son of consolation or son of encouragement. Those are two 
interpretations that I've heard. Son of encouragement or son of consolation. Barnabas was actually the cousin of John Mark, who wrote the uh, second gospel. <clears throat> Barnabas was a man that, that had money. Okay, he had money. He was a man that was, he had money, but he was not attached to his money. How do we know? Because the Acts of Apostles says, Barnabas, he took his field, he sold the field, and he placed the money at the feet of the apostles. Wouldn't that be cool if you sold your field and you put the money at the feet of Father Broom? <laughs> Don't do it unless you speak with your spiritual director. Okay? Get, get proper spiritual director. Okay? But we see in Barnabas, what we see is a man that has spiritual things, but he's generous. Mm -hmm. He recognizes, as Paul quoting Jesus, there's more joy in giving than in receiving. And then... The Acts describes him in these three virtues. It says that Barnabas, Barnabas was a good man. If we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we will have a goodness within us. Can the people that meet us say that you are a good man? Hopefully. Maybe they say it depends on the day. Okay? <laughs> but hopefully at the end of our lives, people will say, Tim was a good man. Okay? Yeah. Maria was a good woman. Hmm? Annette was a good woman. Hmm? Paulina was a good woman. Hopefully people will say, that's a good person. Reflecting the goodness of the Holy Spirit. Then says he was a good man filled with the Holy Spirit. Would you say that you're filled with the Holy Spirit? You're baptized, right? Yes. Are you confirmed? Yes. So in a certain sense, we, we really should be filled with the Holy Spirit. If we're not, it's not his fault. It's our fault, right? Mm -hmm. Then the last thing it says about him, and he was a man of great faith. So those are the three characteristics of him. A good man filled with the Holy Spirit and a man of faith. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't, wouldn't that be beautiful to have that on your tombstone? She was a good man filled with the Holy Spirit and a woman of great faith. Hey, maybe go right, or go to Forest Lawn and that's what I want on my tombstone, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, there's, there's much more that can be said about him, uh, but I, I'd just like to underline one other point. And it's the first reading today in the Mass, is that Saul is going to be converted, and the apostles in Jerusalem, they were... Basically, they were terrified at this guy. The first reading today. Wouldn't you be? Sure. I would be. This guy, <laughs> he was going into homes, arresting Christians, dragging them out, men and women putting them to death. He was there at the death of Stephen. I think I'd be terrified of this guy. No? There he is coming and knocking your door. <laughs> probably thought he'd be probably going to go after you, right? I mean, it would be scary. So it was Barnabas that gave him credit, credibility. Barnabas that gave him credibility. Okay, let's see if we can apply this to ourselves in the Holy Spirit. Let's pray for the grace 
not to speak negatively about other people. Okay? Pray for the grace not to speak negatively about other people. I sometimes listen to Bishop uh, Robert uh, Barron's homilies for the weekend. Uh, The one that he gave today I thought was one of the best I've ever heard. And I actually used it for my homily in my two Spanish masses. And what he said was, um, I am the vine and you're the branches. Why not try to cut away all the dead branches in our lives? And he mentioned, he mentioned the following. First, he said, cut away the dead branch of materialism. Cut away the dead branch of holding on to resentments. How many of us are still holding on to resentment? Be honest. Probably most of us. Then, then he dropped the bomb. And they dropped the bomb at 10 o'clock with a thousand Hispanics. (laughs) And it was pornography. And he said, he said, whenever he talks about that, you can't hear a pin drop. I was preaching to a thousand people. I said that you could hear a pin drop. And I developed that for about five minutes. Cut away. Cut away. Then he said, cut away the dead branch of the cheese mosos. He didn't use that word in English, but you know what a cheese boss is, right? I thought it was superb because how is, how is the vine and the branches? How are the branches going to bring forth fruit if you have a lot of dead branches on it? Hmm? And this, this thought occurred to me only this morning when I was doing my holy hour. If you have a vine, if you have a dead branch, it's not going to bring forth fruit anyway, is it? But that dead branch will prevent the healthy branches from flourishing totally. That never occurred to me except today. But it's true. You got a dead branch and a healthy branch, the dead branch is going to prevent the healthy branch from flourishing to its max. So maybe that's what the Holy Spirit is saying to us today. I am the vine and you're the branches. What are the dead branches right now that are preventing you from flourishing to the max? What are those dead branches? And these dead branches, well, they could even be trimmed or maybe they can just be totally cut off and thrown into the fire. Are we willing to allow the Holy Spirit to do that? It hurts, right? It might hurt. You know, you have an operation. Most of us have probably undergone operations in our lives. I certainly have, and probably most of you have gone through operations, right? It hurts. (laughs) But if it's not done, we might die. Some operations, if we don't undergo those operations, there's a a good chance that we might not survive. But recovery from operations can be pretty painful at times. So if you have things cut away, it might hurt. But in the long run, it's good for us. So that's Barnabas. Uh, So um, last idea would be, last idea would be, Barnabas, you see him several times. He's going to the community and he's, Always encouraging the community. Can you say that wherever you go, you're always encouraging other people? 
Hello? Probably not, huh? Probably not. So that can be a fruit of this meditation that we can start to form a Barney Club, okay? To the Barney, Barney, three of the Barney Club members, okay? See if we can be a source of, of encouragement wherever we go. There's too much negativism out there. There's too much negativism out there. There are two, two words that I hear teenagers saying today. It's becoming a stock phrase, as we used to say in the 60s. No? Uh, it's toxic, and that person is a narcissist. Right? Over the past year, you hear that, especially the younger generation. Toxic. Narcissistic. Now, they're good words. No? You know, toxic, if you know English, English well, toxic actually means poisonous. That's really what it means. Narcissistic. You know where that comes from? It comes from a Greek myth. We have narcissist who is an animal that's looking into a lake. And his name is Narcissus. And by looking into the lake, he falls in love with the image of himself. So that's what narcissism is, is you fall in love with yourself. That's the Greek origin of the word narcissism. Interesting, isn't it? Come from Greek, Greek, uh, Greek literature of the past. I like to call it the egotistic trinity: me, myself, and I. <laughs> Got that? Yes. Me, myself, and I. And as Adrian Rogers say, it's not theology; it's meology. Not theology, it's meology. Okay? It's Davidology, huh? <laughs> okay, so that's uh, Barnabas. Uh, let's pray that we would allow the Sp- Holy Spirit of Barnabas to take control of us. Huh? Amen? Amen? Okay, the next one I wrote was um, the person of John Mark. Okay, John Mark, also we know him as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he went with St. Paul on the first missionary voyage. You've already read through that. And basically he got cold feet. Okay? We would say he, he, he chickened out. No? So he bailed out. So when Barnabas wanted to go on the second missionary journey, he wanted to take with him John Mark, who was his cousin, by the way. And Paul says, no way, Jose. I'm going to take him. No. Because he abandoned us. I find that fascinating. Here you have three of the, three of the greatest saints in the, in, in the Bible. I mean, this is St. Paul. I mean, Barnabas is a huge saint. St. Mark wrote one of the Gospels. And he, here you have them disagreeing and they're quarreling. I think that's an encouraging because even among the best people, sometimes there are disagreements. Right? Sometimes there are disagreements. In the month of June, I'm going to be beginning, beginning a, a marriage a series of marriage talks to try to help out marriages that are really going through tough times. They all are. But one thing I like to say is that the best marriages are not the ones that have disagreements. But rather, the best marriages are those who have disagreements, but they reconcile quickly. It's a sign of a mature marriage. You hear me? Um, I, I honestly, I honestly think that, that my mom and dad had a good marriage. I mean, not perfect, but I think they had a really good marriage. Remember, I was home maybe 20 years ago on vacation, and they had they had disagreement, and it, I it was over something that was kind of stupid, no. And uh, my dad would reconcile indirectly. He, he wouldn't say I'm sorry, but indirectly he would reconcile. 
Now, know what he did? He said to my mom, you know, your, your son who's got my name, my name Eddie, okay? Uh, I'm going to go and get Chinese food. What, do, what would you like, huh? My mom likes Chinese food. So it was kind of cool that they had a quarrel, but within four and a half minutes, right away they bounced back. So that's a, that's a sign of maturity, is that when you have a disagreement, you're not pouting over it, but rather you reconcile before the sun goes down. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, don't allow the sun to go down on your anger. The book of Syrac. So, that's one thing I'd like to mention about Mark and Barnabas and Paul is that they did not end up as enemies. They ended up as friends. They didn't end up as enemies, but they ended up as friends. Once I was Googling in, this kind of fascinates me, is... uh, what is the most famous um, Shakespearean phrase that's quoted? I mean, you got Shakespeare, you got his his tragedies, the comedies, you got the histories. I mean, Shakespeare. Most people agree the greatest writer in the English language. Okay? And I googled it in, and maybe it's changed since this is about a year ago. And it's this one. All is well that ends well. You ever hear that? Did that come from Shakespeare? Yeah. yeah. And I like to say that in re- relationship between Mark and Barnabas and Paul. All is well that ends well. So if there is a disagreement, try to reconcile before the sun goes down. Don't allow the devil to get, the hold, of, to get a hold of you. So if you go to bed angry at your sister or your mother, when you get up in the morning, the anger can be twice as bad. It's the way the devil works. No? So, so we should never never go to bed angry with anyone. Because it, it, it festers. And it can become poison. It can be like cancer. If we arrest cancer at the beginning, we got it. But if it keeps growing and growing, Keeps growing, I mean, we're lost. Okay, so that's uh, my comment on Mark. The next would be on Luke. Okay, we've already talked about Luke, but just one, one last idea on Luke. And it's this. Luke was inspired to give us the third gospel, and to give us the Acts of the Apostles. I think we should be eternally grateful that we have St. Luke that left us these two spiritual masterpieces. Amen? Amen. So if it weren't for St. Luke, we would not be having this course today. And I hope that these people that I'm mentioning inspired by the Holy Spirit, that they will be, they, these will become your friends. That you'll talk to them as you would talk to your best friend. St. Paul calls St. Luke the dear and glorious physician. Because he was a doctor. He was a doctor, he was a writer, he was a missionary, he was a martyr, he was a painter, all these talents. So that's another idea of St. Luke is that he used all these talents to promote the kingdom of God. What about you and your talents? Are you using your talents to the max? Hello? Maybe not. Maybe this mini course in the Acts of the Apostles is going to motivate us to not allow these talents that we have to become rusty or to bury them, as we have in Matthew chapter 25, burying one of the talents. Rather, we want these talents to be recognized, to be cultivated, to be used for the kingdom. Amen? Amen. 
Okay, then we have Okay, we have a, a, a very interesting character. I think you've already met him. If not, you'll meet him this week. His name is Apollos. Have you met Apollos? Yes. Okay, so Apollos, as you, as you remember, was someone that was, was educated in the faith. He was a Greek-speaking person, but he was only educated up to St. John the Baptist. So he had to be taken aside and he had to go deeper in the fullness of the faith. <clears throat> and I see this as related to what is called our call to permanent formation. That we are called as Catholics to work on our formation until the very end of our lives. Now think about this. Remember the passage. Here, Apollo is he's, he's preaching, and he's very powerful, and he's very eloquent, very persuasive, very much like Saint Paul. But what what would have happened if he didn't have the fullness of the faith? He'd be basically preaching to people uh, half of the faith and not the fullness of the faith, and probably be confusing people. For that reason, it's important for us, some of you are catechists, some of you are teaching in one way or another, make sure that you keep going deeper in your faith. And if you don't, so anyway, we might have some catechists here. If you don't know it, don't fake that you know it, okay? You hear me? Okay, what I like to do is someone ask me something, I don't know it, I want to maybe consult my spiritual director or maybe consult a really good book. But it's not a good idea to fake that you know it if you don't know it. <laughs> That's another word for lie. Prevarication. You don't want to be lying. So I, I admire this Apollo that obviously he was brilliant. Very eloquent. But um, he recognized that he didn't know it all. And that brings us into the next. And that would be Priscilla and Aquila. Okay. So Priscilla and Aquila, that was a, a married couple. They became friends with St. Paul. They had the same profession as St. Paul, that they were tent makers. They were very intent on preaching the gospel message. But it was through P Priscilla and Aquila, they took Apollo aside and they explained to Apollo the fullness of the faith. And he was humble enough to allow this couple to explain the fullness of the faith. And he was probably more educated than they were. He probably, he probably knew Aristotle, he probably knew Plato, he probably knew Socrates, he was a Greek. He seemed to be very highly educated, but he allowed these tent makers to basically give him, give him lessons, no? So, I've arrived at the, okay, I arrived at one more, and it would be the person of Cornelius. Cornelius had a vision of Saul. Saul comes in, and he greets him. Paul preaches. Cornelius opens up his heart to the Word of God. Cornelius is baptized, as well as his family, as well as his relatives and friends. So, Cornelius can teach us for ourselves to go after people that don't know Christ and try to teach them the fullness of the faith. Don't be afraid. Many people will not believe because they've never heard. And St. Paul will, will, will go on to say, Woe to me if I do not preach the word of God. Woe to me if I don't preach the word of God. Because faith comes from hearing. Hearing comes from preaching. Preaching the good news of salvation. Amen? Amen. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's say Hail Mary. And hopefully this uh, panoramic vision of the, uh, 
Acts has been helpful to conclude our last lecture. Was this helpful? Yes. yes. So let's say Hail Mary, Mary who's the Mary who is the um, mystical spouse of the Holy Spirit, that we would be open to the workings of the Holy Spirit. And hopefully we'll see you next week so we can start our course of consecration to Mary. Are you going to come? Yes. yes. Invite some friends. It's a totally new course, okay? So we'll see you uh, next week at 630. And I'd like to say the Hail Mary and give you a blessing. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and bless the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. May God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I think we have some of those flyers.